Welcome back to the DLE Own It podcast. This episode features participants across the country joining the May 25th ownership workshop featuring Kelly Goodwin, an international expert in cultural intelligence training and owner of Culture Savvy based in Turkey. Kelly guided participants in raising their ability to recognize and leverage differences within and between team members and work cultures in their organizations. This is Dial Up Your Cultural Awareness in 60 Minutes. Welcome everyone to the Dooley Leadership Experience Workshop. Dial up your cultural awareness in 60 minutes. Please note that this program is being recorded and will be available for subsequent listening on the DLE YouTube channel. Please keep your microphones muted during the presentation. My name is Dan Zabata. I'm a member of the DLE Program Programming Committee and Business Development Committee. I'm based here in the Berkshires where I work as a fire control systems configuration management lead at General Dynamics Mission Systems. I will be moderating today's workshop along with my fellow programming committee member, Kirsten Westerman. Kirsten is an office operations coordinator at Little Diversified Architectural Consulting in Raleigh, North Carolina. To maximize everyone's learning experience, we have some core DLE ground rules. Please use the chat box for your comments and questions that are topic related. Kirsten will be monitoring the chat and will surface your comments or questions to myself and our guest speaker, Kelly Goodwin, during the program. Let's get some practice with the chat right now. Please take a few seconds to type in your name, your title, an organization or company, and where you are located. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. All right, moving, moving on with a few more ground rules. Do your best to minimize distractions and stay focused. Make sure to have a pen and notepad handy so that you are able to take notes and actively participate. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions to Kelly after her presentation, but please put any questions in the chat throughout the workshop and we can field them at the end. This workshop will also feature breakout sessions with open discussion on our values and cultural lenses. Finally, please take a few moments to provide your comments to the workshop feedback poll that you will receive a link to at the conclusion of today's program. There's an exclusive bonus customized by Kelly for this DLE workshop for completing the poll. Kirsten? Thank you, Dan. A reminder for those of you just logging in, please type in your name, title, company, organization, and your location into the chat box if you have not already done so. I'm Kirsten Westerman. I'm a member of the DLE Programming Committee, and I'm the Office Operations Coordinator at Little Diversified Architectural Consulting in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our guest speaker will introduce herself shortly. She's an international expert in cultural intelligence training, currently based in Antalya, Turkey. Welcome, Kelly. I am so excited for your presentation today. Hello everyone, it's wonderful to be here with you all today. Um, as we begin, I just wanna say a special thank you to Linda Dooley and the programming committee members. As we've prepared for this talk today, I have a new appreciation for the commitment of each of the committee members to providing high quality development opportunities for the DLE community. So thank you so much for all your work. So my name is Kelly Goodwin, and I was born to American parents living in Turkey. And growing up between cultures, I always found myself explaining Turks to foreigners and explaining foreigners to Turks. And I think that's really how my passion began for helping people from different backgrounds understand each other and work together effectively. So this led me to study anthropology and intercultural studies. And then I spent six years in the Arab Middle East. Uh, in Iraq, I worked among Marsh Arab women doing anthropological field work. And then in 2014, I moved back to Turkey where I worked as an operations manager for a business that created fair wage dignified work for refugee women who had fleed uh, mostly from ISIS. Um, a few years ago, people started asking me for intercultural training uh, to help them work with others. And pretty soon this training moved on to full scale training that I was doing for groups. And then I became a uh, cultural intelligence certified advanced facilitator. And recently I've also become a certified unconscious bias facilitator. Last year, I started my own business called Culture Savvy, 
and I live and work in Turkey, though at the moment I'm in the US, as you can see the beautiful Pacific Northwest um, forest behind me. It's not a fake background. So as we get started today, I want to give you a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about. First, we're going to talk about why culture matters. I'm going to give you an introduction to cultural intelligence or CQ as we call it for short. We're going to spend most of our time talking about cultural awareness and some specific examples. And then we're going to end with breakout rooms and some action steps. So as we begin, let's start with another chat box activity. And I'd like you to answer the question, what comes to mind when you hear the word culture? Okay, so when you hear that word, what comes to mind? If you're feeling really adventurous, go ahead and type in how you would define culture. What do you think would be a good definition of that word? So I'll give you a few seconds to write in the chat box. So I will, uh, we probably won't get to read all of them, but I will um, pull out a few to just kind of look over together. Um, there isn't really a right or wrong answer, as you'll see in a moment, but um, let me just share some ideas. So um, how people treat each other, the norms of a group of people, different food from different countries, um, filling in, fitting into a group. Uh, standard practices among a group, a work environment, traditions, the way people view life, um, the heartbeat of an organization, uh, the term that encompasses social behavior of people, learned patterns or engraved values, ingrained values, sorry. Um, yeah, so culture includes all of these things. Sometimes we think of culture as out there, um, you know, a different country, a different nationality has culture, or sometimes we think of it as the arts, you know, music and art and dance. Um, but actually, it's a lot deeper than that. So let me take a moment to share with you sociologists definition of culture, just to make sure that we have a common understanding since we'll be using this word a lot today. So culture is a shared pattern of beliefs, values, assumptions, and behaviors that differentiate one group of people from another. So this could be something as small as a family culture. It could be a business place culture. It could be generational culture religious, philosophical, ethnic culture, right? There are lots of different groups that share um, a common way of thinking, a common way of behaving, and any of those groups can be called culture. So it's significant to note, first of all, that this is a very broad definition. It's uh, almost, you could say, across any level of difference. And the second thing is, it's ways of thinking and behaving that are taken for granted. It's just the way we do things around here. It's what's assumed to be normal. So, but sometimes as um, sociologists or anthropologists, we talk about this as lenses. We all wear cultural lenses, whether or not we're aware of them. So it's convenient that I happen to wear lenses. It's a convenient prop. Um, but we often don't realize that everything we see, we're interpreting and viewing through our cultural background. And we don't even realize that we're making an interpretation because, as we said, culture leads us to think that it's just obvious. From our perspective, it's obvious what that behavior means or what those words mean. But when you have, when you're trying to work together with people who are coming from a different cultural perspective, it can often lead to disagreement, it can lead to disrespect, this can erode into mutual distrust, and then how we deal with the resulting conflict is also impacted by our cultural background. So no matter where you live, culture matters. It matters in how you build trust. It matters in how you motivate, how you communicate, how you work together. 
you know, sometimes people tell me, oh, well, culture is really not that big of a deal. If I just respect everyone, it's all going to be fine. But the problem is different cultures have different definitions of even what respect looks like. So no matter how well intentioned you are, intentions are also interpreted through cultural lenses. In fact, the Economist Intelligence Unit has said that 90% of leading executives from 68 countries have said that cross-cultural leadership is the top management challenge that we face. And so this is why entities and organizations like Harvard Business School, BMW, Google, Novartis, government and non-government organizations of all sizes from around the world are investing in developing cultural intelligence in their members. So let's quickly define cultural intelligence. Cultural intelligence, or CQ as we call it, is the capability to function and relate effectively in culturally diverse situations. So it's about being able to relate effectively with people who are different from yourself. So that includes things like cultural awareness that we're going to be talking about today, but it actually goes beyond that to developing the skills that are necessary to address all the kinds of challenges I just mentioned. So cultural intelligence is based on more than 20 years of academic research. Over 200,000 people have been surveyed from over 100 nations. And the question underlying all this research is this. What's the difference between individuals and organizations who succeed in today's globalized multicultural world and those that fail? And out of the research, four capabilities have emerged as what distinguishes those who fail and those who succeed. So the first one we call CQ drive, and this is our motivation piece. This is how interested you are in learning about different cultures and interacting with people from different backgrounds. Now, since you're here today, I'm going to guess that you have at least some degree of motivation for developing cultural intelligence. The next is CQ knowledge, and this is our information piece. So how much do you know about the similarities and differences between cultures? CQ strategy is your ability to take that information and use it to plan and prepare for interactions that you have with people who are different from yourself. And then CQ action is your ability to actually change your behavior so that your point gets across the way you intend it to. So today we're going to be talking mostly about CQ knowledge, your understanding about how cultures are similar and different. Because awareness of your own cultural background and awareness of other people's cultural background is really a foundation for developing cultural intelligence. So academically, we talk about cultural value dimensions. So we put them onto scales where we talk about the differences between what different cultures value. So in our full length training, we talk about 10 of these cultural value scales. But today I'm just going to mention two. And I'm going to share um, some examples of different ways that they show up. And let me start by sharing a story with you. So two years ago, my husband and I went on a work trip to Jordan. And while we were there, we met a retired British lady. And as we were getting to know her, she said, oh, you're Americans. Well, I lived in America for a few years and my husband and I, we just hated it. We could not wait to get out of America. She said, people in America are so unfriendly. I was a little bit surprised because I've traveled a fair bit and um, most people consider Americans to be relatively friendly. And so I said, could you explain that to me? What do you mean when you say Americans are unfriendly? And this lady said, 
Well, so my husband works for this multinational or used to work for this multinational and uh, we spent about 30 years working in Asia and then his last few years we got transferred to America. He was set to work on this big development project. So as he went about work, he'd go to his colleagues and say, hey, can you give me feedback on this? Can you give me input on this? Can you help me out with this? But found that people would always brush him off or disregard him or tell him to go figure it out on his own. And she said they were just so unfriendly. Now, what this lady didn't realize is that this is actually a cultural value difference um, because she also explained how in Asia, what they experienced was that teams would pull together and a success was a team success and a failure was a team failure. So we talk about this as the difference between cooperative versus competitive cultures. So cooperative versus competitive is the extent to which you prefer to achieve results collaboratively working together with other people versus more competitively and on your own. So it's a preference for how to get things done. Cooperative cultures tend to emphasize relationships first and have a more nurturing approach. Has everyone participated in this? How do we all feel about the project? How is it moving forward? But a competitive cultural value will emphasize achievement and putting tasks first. It will be um, much more assertive in its approach. Now, just to be clear, both orientations are concerned about results and both care about relationships, but it's a difference in priority of how to get things done. Is it through conversation or is it through debate? Is it by getting along together or is it by each person being their own personal best? If you think about this, this, uh, this cultural value affects things like how you apply for a job. So if you're trying to get a job at a cooperative company, competitive behavior is going to come across as pushy and aggressive. Conversely, if uh, for a competitive company, a cooperative approach might come across as unassertive and even incompetent. Uh, also, if you're in a negotiation or in a sales pitch and you assume that the other party has a competitive approach, you might emphasize how that party can win and come out ahead. But if they actually value collaboration, your pitch is going to be ineffective because what they want to know is that you value working together. There's also a difference here between uh, ethnic background. So research shows that Caucasians and Asian Americans tend to be more cooperative, sorry, competitive and African American and Latin American heritage tends to have more of a cooperative approach. So it's important to know the background of the people or the organization that you're interested in working with. Last week, the DLE sent out a 10 second poll asking whether um, the culture of the current organization you're with influenced your decision to work there. And I just want to share those results really quickly because 98% said that yes, the cultural environment affected the decision to work at that organization. So I also want to run a quick poll here. Kaylee, if you could launch that for us, I would like you to describe your workplace culture and what which of these cultural values is emphasized in your workplace? So go ahead and um, put your response to the poll and then we'll share those results. All right, so here are the results. 73% said we tend to emphasize collaboration and a nurturing environment. And 27% said we tend to emphasize competition, assertiveness, and achievement. So even though um, three quarters said uh, it's more collaborative, I think this also shows that it's important to know who you're interacting with and what the culture of that location is. 
So um, because what we find is that a difference in this cultural value preference tends to create a lot of misunderstanding and conflict. So even with this retired British lady, her lack of understanding caused her to interpret a cultural value of competitiveness in that particular multinational as unfriendliness. And so this lack of awareness of cultural differences can lead to misunderstanding. So as I describe uh, this value and also the next one, I'd like you to think about which one describes you best personally, because we're going to talk about this during our breakout groups. And I want to emphasize that one cultural value is not better than the other. They're simply different. And as you look at different places around the world, we see how they're spread out along the continuum between cooperative and competitive. So the next one I want to share is uncertainty avoidance. This is sometimes also called risk aversion. So people with low uncertainty avoidance prefer to figure things out as they go. People with high uncertainty avoidance prefer to eliminate ambiguity and uncertainty using planning or even tradition. So as an example, my husband and I are on opposite ends of this scale. So when we have to work together to make a decision, our opinions can be diametrically opposed. I want to think through all the potential risks, all the potential benefits, every possible outcome, everything that could go wrong. And my husband will say, let's just go for it and see what happens. It's an adventure, it'll be fine. And that throws me into a panic. So on a national scale, um, there's an example that Germany has procedures and policies in place for national disasters that have never happened before. So even though there's no precedent, they already have policies and plans in place for how to deal with those disasters. There's also a difference here in department functions. So people in legal or accounting typically rate higher in uncertainty avoidance than people in departments like recruiting or marketing. Um, and this makes sense if you think about it. You want your engineer to be exact and leave nothing to chance, but you want your HR director to be flexible and adaptable. And in fact, this is one of the cultural values that creates the most conflict on diverse teams because individuals with high uncertainty avoidance can view their low uncertainty teammates as reckless and those with low uncertainty avoidance may view their high uncertainty teammates as uptight and unable to go with the flow. So cultural intelligence can help these teammates figure out how to work together. Also, when we're talking about generational differences, boomers tend to prefer uncertainty avoidance and to seek certainty where Gen X and Gen Y are typically much more comfortable with uncertainty, taking risks, um, making mistakes in the process and just going with the flow. So when you're trying to work and relate with someone, it's really helpful to understand where they are in this cultural value scale so that you can understand the motivator behind their decisions and behind the things that they say. So cooperative versus competitive and uncertainty avoidance um, it are really helpful to be aware of when we're working together with people to understand what's influencing the things that they say and the decisions that they make. So if I'm communicating or working with someone from the other side, it can be really confusing or even frustrating. You know, you feel like you just can't see eye to eye. Maybe you want to pull your hair out and go, it just doesn't make sense, right? Has that ever happened to you? I'd encourage you to add two little words to that phrase. That doesn't make sense to me. And this is from Dr. David Livermore, co-founder of the Cultural Intelligence Center. And 
I call this a power phrase because it does two things. Saying that doesn't make sense to me, first of all, points out our cultural self-awareness. It causes us to stop and think, you know, what are my own cultural lenses? How is my own background affecting how I view this situation? And secondly, it reminds us to practice our cultural awareness of the other person, to look at their perspective and even spark curiosity to understand them and their perspective or their cultural background better. So understanding that these are simply different perspectives can help us take a non-judgmental approach when we're working and relating with others. We're going to move on now to the breakout groups. And I have two questions I would like you to talk about to help develop your cultural awareness. So the first question is, which of the cultural values do you personally identify with? So remember that one is not better than the other. It's just a preference. And actually, these preferences, these cultural values are instilled in us from childhood, from a very young age. Um, so hopefully you'll have both sides represented in your group, or you may feel like, well, it's more moderate, not quite on either extreme, and that's fine too. And the second question I would like you to uh, share about is what shaped that value in you? So take some time to think about what contributed to shaping that value. Is it your family culture? Was it the school or the educational system you were in? Is it the part of the country you were raised in? Could it be your own personality? So there could be lots of uh, different factors, but just take some time to think about what contributed to shaping those values in you. And you will have 10 minutes to discuss these and then we'll come back and the group leaders will each share for a minute uh, summarizing their discussions. So Kaylee, could you send everyone to their breakout rooms, please? Well, welcome back everybody. I hope you guys enjoyed your conversations. Uh, we'll go with the, around with the group leaders to kind of discuss what you guys uh, chatted about. Marcus, you want to go first? Yeah, I can go first. Can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome. So like always, 10 minutes is never enough. Uh, we had a diverse group in our breakout. We had an anthropologist, a colleague of our guest speaker uh, today. We had a high school student. We had a couple of engineers um, and of all different age ranges. Um, we had some great feedback and conversation. Um, with the first question of which of the cultural values do you personally identify with, we had a great mix. Um, we have several, we had a couple of people that were um, felt more cooperative. Some people felt more um, collaborative, but they didn't feel like it was mutually exclusive. It was like more so you might lean towards one more than the other, um, but you had a little bit of both. Um, what what shaped the value in you? Um, it, it really main main categories experiences was one in geography so experiences um and one thing about experiences is as you experience them potentially your view and values might change and also your age doesn't mean that you have more experience than someone that was younger someone that was younger might have three to three to four times as many experiences than a person that's older when it came to geography uh, julia brought up the country makes up a big um, part of someone and also, Nate brought up geography, one and more so in the United States and moved towards um, the Midwest and Denver compared to his experience on the Northeast um, had a, a big influence on himself. Last thing before I pass it on to someone else, um, interesting for uh, different things that shaped you, uh, we had Kristen, who's a high school student. Football was a big influence on his uh, cultural value of being more on the competitive side. For football, he always thought about being the best athlete. How do I get a, up on my opponent? So that's naturally how he, he leans towards. That's awesome. Thanks, Marcus. Uh, let's go to Evie. 
So in our group, um, we had uh, an engineer, we had, um, uh, I know Cecilia works at Williams as, as I do, so she's in HR. And then we had um, Katie from the VLE. And it was really interesting because we all really um, leaned more towards the collaborative, um, but for different reasons. A lot of the main things that were brought up was definitely our racial and ethnic backgrounds. Um, our family upbringing was huge. And then two things that I, that I personally found interesting was the age and, and sex because um, Cecilia had mentioned about being a female and having to step back sometimes and have to listen to what others had to say first because she felt that her voice wasn't gonna be heard based on gender. Um, so really just the fact that we all felt that we were more leaning towards collaboration, but for different reasons. And that at different points and different reasons why we had to then move to cooperative, um, some things that were mentioned were like sports teams. And when we had, we were kind of forced to have to be more on, on that dynamic of, of the spectrum, as well as when you felt that you needed to have your team backing you up so you would lean more towards being on the collaborative side versus the cooperative side. The other one was the uncertainty avoidance. It seemed like the group consensus for us was we were more on the high. Um, I know for myself, I'm in finances, so I think that that was just for me why I, I tend to be more of a high that and being a mom. I mean, with kids, you just naturally, I think, plan to be more uh, risk averted. Um, so it's definitely very interesting just seeing that it didn't, the age didn't really come up, which I, I thought would have because there was a mix of, of our ages there, but it was really more focused on the, the family background, the race and, and sex, which, um, considering that those things are so prominent in the way that our values are shaped, I think that it was definitely interesting and eye-opening to see that. So. Thanks, Evie. And that's why this is such a great topic, right? There's so many different... It can be you know, on any yeah, level. Yeah, <laughs> there's so many different things that can, that influence these, you know, everybody's cultural differences. Um, Kirsten? Yeah, so our group was pretty much the same in the sense that we feel like we could have teetered on any side of the spectrum. It really depended on what environment we were in and kind of where we are in our life. So I know Jamie mentioned at one point he felt he was more competitive, but as he's gotten older, he feels like he's a little more cooperative. So I definitely think where you are in your life, we definitely also brought up sports teams. That's huge and depending on kind of where you lean in that sense you kind of have to have that competitive edge but especially if it's a team sport then you kind of have that collaborative edge to you um linda mentioned that having her own business she kind of always felt a little more competitive and everything but she joined rowing especially doing team rowing to kind of give her that collaborative edge kind of bring that into her work so it's really cool how you can kind of find different types of cultural backgrounds to kind of put into your work. Um, so yeah, it was a really interesting conversation and we got a lot out of it. We could have talked for a lot longer. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Kirsten. We, we could have too, right? We only got to the first question. We didn't even get to the second question. Uh, we did have a very diverse group. It was great. Um, and, and half were on the competitive side and um, Jonathan and I were kind of half and half on both competitive and collaborative. And then um, Cheryl, Crystal, and Jonathan were all high avoidance. They, they like reduce the amount of risks and I'm more of a kind of a go with the flow kind of guy. So that's kind of the way uh, that panned out. But we had such a good conversation about how culturally America is more competitive, right? And that's just kind of how, how we, we just kind of been I don't know, like raised to be more competitive. And, and so 
like I used to be, but since I got out of sports, it's always been, I've always been trying to be collaborative since I was in the Navy and that that's kind of what they taught us. Right. So um, it was just an interesting dynamic between the group and we could have talked for probably two hours about this subject. It's, it's that great. And, and that's why I can't wait for the, the follow on three part that's going to come later that, that Kelly's going to give. So now I'm going to turn it over um, to Kirsten for questions. Kirsten and Kelly, sorry. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, we definitely have some great um, questions that popped up in the chat. So let me start with the first one that came up. So this is from Christian. Kelly, he asked, is it possible to find a culture that is both cooperative and competitive? So when we um look intensely at these cultural value scales, we actually plot them along a continuum. So cooperative, competitive on one end, uh, cooperative on one end, competitive on the other end. And so we would call that more a moderate approach. So not strongly on one side or strongly on the other. So I don't think one organization can be on both sides simultaneously. It may have individuals in it who are on different sides. Um, but if it's an organization, I would say then it's probably more moderate in the middle. Thanks, Kelly. And then along with that, Cheryl asked, how do you address comments in the workplace about being a good culture fit? Yeah, that is a big topic. <laughs> I'm not sure how to, how to address it here. Um, I think the most concerning thing is if being a good culture fit is really code for we're looking for people who are like us, right? Because culture means someone who shares my assumptions about what's normal, about how to get things done. And so um, does that mean we're just looking for people who are all alike? Um, so that's kind of part of a much bigger discussion. Um, but I think if an organization uses that, it's worth looking into and what does that mean and what's being valued um, through those kinds of comments. Thanks. And this also, again, is probably just such a huge answer. But if you had any types of tips, uh, Christian asked, what advice would you give to an individual who is personally on the competitive side? but is in a group culture that shares a cooperative culture value. Yeah, um, actually, let me um, switch to the slide. Um, so let me give you um, some practical tips actually for working on either side. So if you're working with people who are more competitive, um, focus on the task first and make sure your communication is for reporting information. But if you're working with people who are cooperative, focus on establishing the relationship before the task and use communication as a way to build rapport and to build trust with others. Awesome, thanks Kelly. And let me just ask one more, I think we have time for one more. So this is a good one. If you're not a leader for your organization, how can you influence leadership to implement cultural intelligence practices? Yeah, um, so this is one, um, yeah, we'll talk about more in our full length workshop. Let me just say here, um, I'm going to be partnering with the DLE to do a full length workshop in the fall, um, where we will talk about all four of the CQ capabilities and the specific skills to develop them. Um, but I would say start by looking at motivation. So what's going to be motivating for your leaders? So look at return on investment. There's a lot of research out there that shows um, teams, organizations with high CQ are more profitable, they're more effective, they have exponentially higher innovation, um, so you can do that research or in the bonus uh, takeaway, there's my email address, you can reach out to me and I can send you resources. Um, but I would say look at what would be motivating for them um, and use those arguments to show that developing CQ can actually help them uh, reach their goals, both 
uh, as leaders and as an organization. Awesome, thanks Kelly. I think that's all the questions we have. So if you wanna move into some of your action steps we can wrap up. Yeah. So um, I'll just leave you with three action steps. The first is tap into your motivation. So remember the first part of the CQ model is drive. So think about your personal and professional goals and think about how developing CQ can help you achieve those goals. The second thing is remember our power phrase, that doesn't make sense to me. And then third, um, become more aware of your own cultural lenses. So I've put together material in the bonus file that you'll get when you complete the poll. Um, and it has questions for reflection to help you develop some more cultural awareness. So I think that's um, now over to Linda. Well, I want to thank everyone. Kelly mentioned this bonus and it is I think something for you to, well, first, easy to access. All you do is you're going to have a quick poll link. Please just tell us what you thought about this workshop. We want your feedback to help us both evaluate this and plan for future ones. But as you do respond, you'll be getting this quick, this uh, bonus uh, skill sharpener. And it is a great refresher for you. Going through the questions, keep, keep asking yourself. This is an area for continuous improvement, but asking yourself about how you can clear that lens and be able to see and seize people's differences in different ways than you are right now. Um, Kelly mentioned we put a lot of time into this. I wanna thank you, Kelly, because uh, with the advanced prep, with the dry runs, you just did an outstanding time. We had a straddled time zones and I wanna thank you for making that happen. Um, I'd also like to thank our amazing team of volunteers. So programs like this don't happen magically. We have a team of volunteers that give us their time, their talent, and those leading this program tonight are Evie Rodriguez Campos, Kaylee Carmel, Kirsten Westerman, Sherian Stanton, Kate Lawson, and of course our welcoming moderator, Dan Zabata. Um, I welcome those who are joining us for the first time. Hit the DLE website, dle.dooley.com. You have access to many free complimentary programs, including our YouTube channel of videos and professional development podcasts, as well as access to all the programs. And we've got some good ones coming up next month. Our culture chat team and Crystal Blake's part of that team um, met last night. And we are going to tackle the topic uh, on the 25th at Culture Chat on how we are making the still changing workplace work. So we're gonna look at what organizations are doing to adjust to this trifecta workplace model of in, play, of in person, remote and hybrid. And as you log out tonight, I wanna to have you think about what was that phrase that we've all written down about, it just doesn't make sense what to me and think about how you can use that tomorrow and each day going forward. So thank you everyone for joining tonight. Remember to take that poll, you'll get the bonus skill sharpener. Have a wonderful holiday weekend and we hope to see you in June at our upcoming programs. Thanks everybody. Thanks for listening. Be sure to visit us at dle.dooley.com to learn about all of our high impact virtual programming and development opportunities.